And so what is the shelter from the storm? I hear people like Peter Zeehan saying, um, hey, the U.S., because we had vaccines out first, we're going to have our economy started first. We're going to get out way ahead of everybody else. And that's going to be great for us. Is that a big enough shelter from the storm? How, how in the world does anybody that says, I see what, what Dr. Hunt is saying and I want to get out of, of this trouble, or are we just all on this Titanic together? Well, um, we, we did get a head start. We, we were the first out with major vaccination, and that gives us a, a marginal benefit. And, and keep in mind, both Europe and Japan declined economically in the first quarter. I mean, that's already evident. Their numbers were down. We had a gain in the first quarter. Um, the, the, um, but but that, that benefit will pass. Um, and uh, some people say, well, productivity will save us. Uh, that will the productivity will come along. Uh, that's what Bill Gates believes. Um, but I don't I don't think that productivity will save us, and I'll, I'll tell you why. And, and um, the I'm influenced by the the work of Dr. Robert Gordon at Northwestern, who wrote a fantastic book called "The Rise and Fall of American Economic Growth." And what Dr. Gordon points out is that in the heyday of American economic growth from 19, from 1870 to 1970, we had what he called five revolutionary inventions. The combustion engine was one of them, transmission of electricity, modern sanitation, modern communication, pharmaceuticals and chemicals. Now think about the combustion engine. Think about how much demand that created for the other factors of production, labor and natural resources. I mean, you need to build the assembly line, then you build the highways and bridges, supply chains. So, So those revolutionary inventions in our heyday of growth enhance the demand for labor and raw materials. Today, what Dr. Gordon is saying is that the innovations are more evolutionary. For example, if you if you replace a cash register with a scanner, you get rid of some people, but you don't really require any more in the way of, of resources with of, of land. In other words, the, these evolutionary types of, of technology don't enhance the demand for the other factors of production. And we're seeing this on the assembly line. And we're seeing it a lot of different ways. And so um, technology could, could do that. But I, I, I think that right now we don't have that type of clear technology uh, available to us. That's fascinating. It makes total sense to me. Like everything we see going on right now, if you make a computer faster, right, all that means is maybe you need less people or the amount of time it took you to do something goes down. So if you're paying hourly workers, that's that's going down as well. That's Dr. Gordon's point. Exactly. And and I think like uh, that's something that we haven't really been talking about. It's almost been completely ignored. As you look out on the horizon, you know, I often say the news doesn't tell us what to think. It tells us what to think about and that the best thing you can do is not be guided by what the news tells you to think about, but what do you think is important? What do you think are the, the signals in the market that people should be paying more attention to that, that are not often talked about? Well, um, I, I think that, I think that, um, the markets themselves only provide very limited information about what the economy will do in the future. Um, I, I think that there was a time when the stock market was something of a leading economic indicator. Uh, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, and I, the reason I say that 
is that um, as a result of, of becoming so heavily indebted, uh, we're getting this pronounced decline in the velocity of money. So if the Fed increases the money supply 20%, which is what it's done this year, last 12 months, the, when the velocity of money falls, the liquidity is trapped in the financial markets. And so this liquidity bids up the price of financial assets, forces down their rate of return. Uh, and, it, and, and the corporate managers are forced to put more of their assets in financial assets rather than real assets. But growth doesn't come from financial assets. Growth comes from physical investment, implication, in investment of new technology. Um, in economics, one of the most fundamental relationships, which it universally applies, is that investment, physical investment, must equal saving out of income. And saving out of income has three components, private saving, government dis-saving, and then net foreign saving, which is the inverse of the, of the trade deficit. All right, since 1929, the net national saving was 6.5%, uh, which means that real investment was 6.5%. Well, last year, uh, the household saving and private saving went up, but the government deficit went down, deteriorated. And so net national saving was, was not much above zero. It's historically six and a half percent. And so if you, if you look at the historical record, the current level of net national saving is only worse during 08 and 09 and during the 1930s. So when, so when you're taking on this debt, you, you absorb your net national saving, and there are no funds to go into physical investment. And that undermines your growth. This is another mechanism. There, there's another mechanism that, that undermines your growth here. When the government borrows a lot more money uh, to, to support you know, people in distress because of the pandemic or to solve problems, they, they, do, they do so with the best of intentions. But intentions have nothing to do with whether the policy is helpful or not. <laughs> and, and so as the government debt goes up, the government share of economic activity goes up. But that means the private share goes down. In other words, you, you keep moving um, toward a more governmentally oriented economy. Well, you your income and wealth doesn't come from the government sector. It comes from the private sector. And um, so what we're basically doing is we're, the folks that um, run the DMV and the post office are getting bigger and bigger, and the private sector is getting smaller. Man, that's a, that is a scary, scary thought, right? Because once those bureaucracies grow, it's almost impossible to ever shrink them. So that, that's like permanent. Impossible. That's, that's why the BS uh, developed this term debt trap. We take on too much debt, it slows economic activity. And the only solution that anyone can come up with is to take on more debt in the hope that somehow that this, the, the debt will be uh, behave differently this time than it's been, been behaving. And so you get further and further into the debt trap. Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures. <laughs>